thanks for doing this with us. What's going on? What do we got going on? I, I, I know a little. I, know, I see DJ Wonder down there. I see mm-hmm. Alana. I see you. Yeah. So, I mean, I just want to go on record, say this is the best eBay purchase I've ever made. And <laughs> I make a lot of them. You know, I'm kind of an eBay queen. But I can't tell you how many people forwarded me your story when you posted you were doing this with the charity. They're like, you need to get on this. This is you. We run a party called Grunch. So it's a grunge brunch based in New York City. So Uh that's DJ Wonder. I'm Alana. That's so Raven. And basically, I don't know if that sounds familiar to you or not, but you did make a song about it last year and it didn't go viral on Cameo. I mean, maybe we need to we need to put David Kahn on it. but. yeah. <laughs> and 90s grunge brunch, man. That is so cool. You guys do lots of uh, memes and stuff. Am I correct? Do I, I, I've seen the grunge memes on, well, especially on Instagram. That's yeah, kind we, we spearheaded hashtag Mark McGrath Monday. You know, there's no better way to start the week than with the goat of the 90s to us. So. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be right in your things. company right now. <laughs> you, you say all the right things. And you guys put a smile on my face. It's, it's fun after all these years that, you know, we can still have fun with it. And I, I like to say the stink of the 90s has kind of gone away. So these old bands become new again. You, you know what I mean? And totally. we, kind of, we kind of look back at decades with, with rose-tinted glasses and go, oh, you know, what? highlighted hair wasn't, you know, frosted tips weren't so bad after all, you know. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> or maybe <nice>. not. <laughs> I fully embrace it. So, I mean, we start the week with you. And as you know, you see all the memes and whatnot. We end it with one of your buddies, Fred Durst, on a Fred Durst Friday. I do have a question. Sure. September 28th, 2000, you attended the Playboy Mansion party for the release of Chocolate Starfish. So, I did. Yeah, there is a meme going around about you. It's you, mm-hmm. Chino from the Deftones, and Fred Durst. Everyone says it's their dream blunt rotation. So who would your dream blunt rotation be? Boy, you guys, uh, you guys need to dream a little higher over there. For us. I, I, uh, I appreciate the irony and the fun you guys are having. I think Tommy Lee is part of that picture. If I'm He's not in mistaken. there as well. Yes. So mm-hmm. there's another, you know, if you want to make almost a, a quad, you know, not uh, mad at that. a quad pass. My dream blunt rotation. I don't smoke weed. I'll qualify it with that because I, I my my throat chokes. I have a psychosomatic reaction. And all I do is ask people, how quickly can you take me to the hospital? And they're like, dude, you're just high. Relax. <laughs> anyway, if I'm smoking, my, my, my bud trifecta would be Bob Marley. Okay. Cause I'm making a what live or I'm you know, living or, or, or not. It'd be Bob Marley. And then maybe someone would be very philosophical and cool and kind of interesting to talk to. I might have to go like Socrates on that. I'm going, wow. I'm going to, I mean, cause the likelihood of like, you know, Chino and Fred Durst and I passing a blunt is probably as likely as Bob, Bob Marley and Socrates and Mark McGrath yeah. passing a blunt. And I love Chino and I love I love Fred and I'm proud to say we're still friends after all these years. But I don't think Fred's a big weed smoker and I don't think Chino was really really into that. So are you guys in the big weed? Is the are you guys smoking the uh, the pot? Actually, no. <laughs> yeah, I've never <laughs> smoked weed I... in my life ever, man. This is the <laughs> thing too much, man. Yeah, I'll tell you what. What you do is you. you what, for me, they say smoke pot, but it's fun, and I laugh for fifteen minutes. Then I sit in front of the refrigerator and eat everything in there, but but it doesn't have to be food. I'll just eat like mayonnaise, and I'll just eat like <laughs> you know left. It, it's really it's really depressing actually to see. Oh my gosh! I mean, also, I mean, I've watched this countless of times, like on YouTube. They also you get thanks for being in the Roland video. Mark McGrath. Okay, Mark, right here. Mark, what are you doing? Dude, I'm listening to rolling, 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 rolling on the way over here, man. Thanks for asking me to be in the video, man. You, you know? got it, dude. Pop hey, rock. you did killer. Huh? When you were breaking in the video? That was excellent. I don't know if this is just a joke, but Fred thanks you for being in the rolling video. And I was like, well, it's not too far off because you used to break dance, if I'm not, you know, mistaken. And you went by the name Yukon Cornelius, is that right? God, you guys are amazing. Yeah, I mean, yes, indeed. I, my name is Yukon Cornelius. I got it from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He was the uh, the kind of uh, mountaineer that Rudolph encountered that helped him kind of lead his way. Doesn't get enough due in popular <laughs> culture. I mean, Yukon Cornelius yeah. should be you know, should be celebrated, certainly every Christmas. But yeah, that was my nickname. Didn't really roll off the tongue that much, so people didn't really use it. But uh, yeah, we were a part of a breakdance group called the Crown Town Crew in 1983 to 1984. 
And we were the guys in Newport Beach that would take all the people that come down to the beach and we would challenge them. And I was the only guy that could do windmills. So I'd have to do cleanup duty for everybody doing these terrible break moves, you know? So, uh, (laughs) but I'm proud to say my breakdance moves are over. I think at a wedding about 10 years ago, I tried to do a New York backspin and I knocked my two front teeth out. No way. I'm like that. Yeah. I go, this might be my last breakdancing moment and I'm going to the hospital. See you guys later. Oh okay. my gosh! <laughs> I mean, they should have put you in the Roland video. Then they messed up on that part, huh? I I wasn't in that video, and I I, I didn't know Fred said that. I know Fred used to break dance, or certainly yeah. used to break dance. Chino was a big break dancer. It's mm-hmm. funny how we all just kind of have these paths and kind of you know you wouldn't necessarily think that we're connected in some ways. But also Zach De La Rocha from Rage Against Machine used to break dance with us in uh, U- uh, UCI UC Irvine in Orange County. So and break they- dancing was kind of our intro to. I guess hip hop, which would be ironically a foundation for all four of our bands. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Deftones still have a DJ in their band. All of our songs have like a hip hop, at least beat, backbeat under them. Fred straight raps. You know, Zach started rap rock, but don't call his Rage Machine rap rock. uh, (laughs) That won't sit well. Yeah. I mean, you guys essentially were rap rock before rap rock took off. I mean, Lemonade and Brownies, DJ Lethal produced it. I mean, not a lot of people know your history, you toured with Korn. I mean, it was a whole other band for you before Floored. Yeah, you know, in 1994, we got signed in 94, our record came out in 95, and it's called Lemonade and Brownies. It's all over the place. You know, there's there's R&B jams, there's punk rock songs, there's rock songs. We were like kids in a candy store. We didn't know how to write a song. You know, we literally had two original songs, and we lied to Atlantic Records when we got signed, and we said, yeah, we got a ton of songs. And we're like, oh, shit, careful what you asked for. Now we got to make a record. Now, House of Pain had just come out with Jump Around. We thought that was the greatest song in the world. And we, we thought the, the whole look was cool. We just wanted to be House of Pain. So we got DJ Lethal to produce the record. And we found out he wasn't the one to produce Jump Around. Mugs from Cypress Hill did. So we're like, yeah. all right, we can work with this. And so what would happen? We were a band, but Lethal would give us tracks. And I'm like, we don't rap, we're a band. And so it was really interesting. We had to kind of learn to work together. And through that weirdness came out Lemonade and Brownings that has all these styles, if you will, on it. And Ra- Rage's Machine went over there in 91, 92 and just blew doors off in festivals. You know, they were not, not a lot was happening here in America for them, but in Europe, they were just like, Europe got it right away. So when Corn went over there, Downset and bands like that, they were kind of rap rocking. Adidas rock was kind of coming around then. So we kind of got caught up in that. And it was the only bit of success we had. So we kind of rode the train a little bit. We toured with Monster Magnet, the Deftones, Corn, Lords of Brooklyn. So we got to be, ironically, that was the kind of lane we went in, sort of rap rock before rap rock was even a genre. But then we got better as players and better as songwriters. And we stumbled a song called Fly, which completely changed the trajectory of the band after that. We're like, uh, this number one song stuff is kind of cool, man. We got our debts paid. We, our registration's up to date, man. You know, let's keep on, let's keep on trying to to see if this might be our lane, you know? So there were so many people involved in the songwriting that all our influences came out. Can you talk a little bit about the tour? You know, there is like this infamous story about Howard Stern, how you almost didn't even get to make floor, like how that all came about with the cover that you guys did. Absolutely true story. We're on a, a tour and it was the last gaffes tour in America. We, we made a little bit of noise, like I said, with the band, with the with the uh, record Lemonade and Brownies in some territories in Europe. Not really enough to convince the label to make a second record. So we were we were really on the precipice there of, of not getting to make a second record. So we were thinking, what can we do? How, how do you know? I was a huge. I've always been a huge Howard Stern fan, and a guy at the label said, "Listen, Mark." Howard's been asking for, for years on the radio, someone should cover my songs. One of these signed bands should cover my songs. They're so great, blah, blah, blah. And there's these songs he wrote when he was in, we eight years old. They're unlistable. You know, they were like, they were a joke. And I think the Meat Puppets were supposed to do it, but they were kind of caught up in their business back then. And they never got around to it. So our label rep said, dude, stop. we were on our way to like Wyoming or something. He goes, dude, just stop off at the first studio you can and record the song and just send it. It's, it's worth a shot. So we went to Denver Community College and knocked on the recording door there and said, hey, we're a band. We're on Atlantic Records. We want we want to cover a song. Can someone record us? There was two guys that said, yeah, sure, we can. So we worked the song out in three hours to like a slammed out punk rock thrash version of Psychedelic B and then sent it with our last bit of money, FedEx, to uh, our manager in New York. Now, there was no phones back then, no internet, no anything. We didn't have credit cards, nothing. So... 
This was on a Wednesday, and we were traveling to Wyoming. We were playing in front of three people a night. It was really depressing. Like, it, it was over. I mean, we, were, we had, like, a two weeks left until it was just going to be tour support done. Thanks for playing. And we get to this club, and it's about 12 in the afternoon when we pull up, and the club manager's there. And usually they're not there till later to open the clubs because these were small clubs. He goes, you guys, your manager's been calling every day. Howard Stern's been playing this song all day long today. He wants you in the studio on Monday. Call your manager right now. Call your label. So we called our manager. He goes, dude, leave your stuff where it is. Get on the next plane. Howard Stern wants you to play in the state in the studio, Psychedelic B. So to make a long story even longer, we went into the studio, we, uh, played Psychedelic B. He loved it. He, 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 he talked to us about girls, all the stuff for like two hours. We brought some girls because he knew you know, we knew what to, how to appeal to Howard Stern. It ended up being about an hour and a half segment, and all the guys from Atlantic Records came down, and they go, okay, we'll let you make a second record. And because of that, we got the financing for Florida, which led to fly. So he absolutely, Howard Stern takes credit for a lot of things, but he can absolutely take credit for uh, the success of this band. Yeah, I mean, that's that's such an insane story. And you guys have done so many covers over the years. I mean, from Adam to Ants and, like, to that. Is there anything that you haven't covered that you still would like to do? You know, it's really fun when, back in the day at least, Atlantic Records would give you all this money and you're like, oh, man, let's cover an Adam Ant song just for no reason. Let's cover, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a, a Black Flag song, a Ted Nugent song. We would just cover songs for no reason because we had all this money. We, we, we had a hard time writing songs. We, we, we would cover, and we started as a cover band. So we would just record cover songs for fun, also to get the, like, you know, the, the creative wheels turning and just get the recording wheels turning and feel like we were doing something. We always, I mean, we just covered uh, Pina Colada on our last record. So we're always covering songs. We're always adding cover songs to the set because I, like everybody else, I don't want to hear our new stuff. I don't want to hear your new stuff. I want to hear cover songs. I want to have fun. So we'll play Chumbawamba Live. We'll play Sublime. We'll uh, we'll play Joe Jackson. We'll play anything, you know, as long as it's a hit and we'll put people to sleep because that's our job with our material, you know? I respect that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I mean, if you listen to Floored, obviously Fly is like the anomaly on the whole record, right? I mean, it sounds like nothing else. And I mean, that's all thanks to David Kahn, right? I mean, he came in the studio and showed you guys your sound. Well, you should have first heard the original version of Fly. Fly was a song that was realized when I first heard it. Our, our drummer and our bass player, you know, we all kind of write separately, then come together. Or there's no really way to write. It can happen in any way. I wrote Sunday on bass. I'm not a bass player. I'm just messing around one day. Our guitar player goes, Rodney. Rodney goes, what's that? I go, I'm just messing around. He goes, no, it's not. That's our new song. So songs just got written so so crazy way. So they were working on a little piece and it was called, he goes, Stan and our bass player Murphy came up to me and they go, we've got this song, this song, we think it's called Fly. And it was like, ah, just want to yeah. I was like, <laughs> I quit. I quit. There was no structure. There was no, I go, I, I don't know what this is, blah, blah, blah. And it was so different than ending on the record. And we were, and again, we were really leaning into the rap rock thing because it was starting to take, we was starting to take some, uh, Started to get some claws. I mean, we were on the cover of Kerrang! magazine a few times in the UK. So mm -hmm. I could see maybe this wasn't going to be our lane. But our good friend, Mick G, who does, still my best friend, did all our videos, Fly Every Morning, uh, When It's Over. He did Pretty Fly for a White Guy. He did uh, Santeria by Sublime. I mean, he did Freak on a Leash by Corn. He basically dominated. Yeah, the, you know, Mick G. Uh, he goes, dude, go back and listen to Fly. See if you can put up some verses or something to it. And make it a song because there's something there. I didn't hear it. You know, I, I first listened to it. I hated it. So I go, okay, I will. What am I going to do? Quit the band? So I added some verses to it and made it, put structure to the song, brought it out of this crazy, like, eh, put it, you know, just put it into my thing. And it started to take a little bit of shape. I didn't think it was that much, but we brought David Kahn in, who was coming off the success of Sublime's What I Got. Now, mm -hmm. if you know Sublime like I do, I mean, I was there when they... They may or may not show up to their gigs. We opened for them a few times early in their career and our career. They would show up and play 90-minute dub jams. One song. Boom, boom, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. So, again, you look back with rose-tinted glasses and, you know, Sublime's is untouchable force, and rightfully so. But it took a lot of, you know, it took a village to realize the genius of Bradley Knoll. So when we heard that Sublime had this hit, we're like, that's that's almost impossible. It's us, we, it's us having a hit. Who did it? 
David Kahn. So we kind of felt, I don't want to say we felt flying was in the, the vein of what I got. What I got is a classic, not to be touched. But we felt there was something there, and we hope, we hope David could do something with it. Mm-hmm. So David came down. He listened to all of our stuff. We were in New York, and, and we wanted to, him to produce the record. He hated everything except fly. Uh, uh, and all the rap, rock, horse shit, didn't like any of it. And then we were playing fly, and I'm like, 25 years old, my mother, God rest her soul. And he goes, what was that No. I go, I don't know. I don't know which one. I'm not a singer. He goes, the mother, God rest his soul. And I did it again. He goes, on that note right there on this song, I think we can sell 2 million records. And so we did. But what yeah. happened is when I went into the studio to record Fly, you know, he let me scream and let me do the other things like RPM and stuff like that. I will let you and all that. On Fly, he goes, I'm going to give you your voice right now. OK, I goes, he goes, I got some good news, and some bad news for you, Mark. And I'm about to record Fly. The label's watching. The band's watching. This is our only shot. He go, and I go, being the Irishman I am, I go, what's the bad news, David? He goes, the bad news is you can't sing. I go, huh? I can't possibly think what the good news is. But what's the good news? He goes, the good news is I've got this new technology here that I'm kind of, you know, on the forefront of called Pro Tools that I can lead you to where your voice wants to be. So I just got down on my knees and I went, Calgon, take me away. And David wow. just kind of showed me where my voice was. So I, all around the world, stop. Boop, 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 boop. We work on it. All around the world, statues, crump, stop. And so we just built this thing. And he goes, here's where your voice is. You've got a great tone right here. You get out here, it's squirrely. So I could never, ever underestimate the value of David Kahn and not only fly in Florida, but lead, leading me to water where my voice wants to be. I mean, half of singing is knowing what you can do as well as what you can't do. Yeah. I mean, and then you guys went into every morning. I mean, was it, was it weird before we get to that real quick? Was it weird performing fly since it was so different than all your other tracks? Cause I'm sure you were used to like jumping around on stage. I read lighting your pubes on fire at one point. Um, a lot of crazy things <laughs> hanging from the rafters. Fly was yeah, uh, a lot more up. mellow for you guys to perform. So did it feel foreign at all? You know, our drummer was the old pubes on fire guy. You know what I mean? To get I found all I the find credit, weird YouTube clips. You give him all the credit he deserves, you know. At, at our pop-up video, you know, that was the one thing. He was really pissed off. He goes, oh, by the way, the drummer's known at parties to light his pubes on fire. Go, yeah, <laughs> they ain't lying. You do do that. Uh, but, of course, everything is now that I did that, you know what I mean, which is kind of funny. Um, you know, if, if you listen to the early records, I'm not going to say we were headed towards songs like Fly. Yeah. But – it was all over the place. Now, live, we were straight ahead. We were slashing, rapping, I mean, rapping, rocking, punking out. Like, just, it was thrash. So, I think we looked at Fly, because Fly exploded immediately. So, it wasn't like we had to introduce this new song and work it. It was a gigantic hit already. So, I think it was just the opposite. We had something to look forward to, this mm-hmm. giant hit. And, you know, music was changing. Lollapalooza slammed down the doors of genres. You know, no longer was it. This is, you know, this is Rollins Band and there's Blink-182 and then here's the Boredoms and here's, um, here's Guided by Voices and here's Built to Spill and, 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 and here's a body count. Like it just it busted down all the doors. So you just listen to anything. Mm-hmm. And so I don't, we didn't really suffer that where people are like, oh, this thing. So there's a little bit of sellout stuff from like the eight people that bought the first record. But, but other than that, it, it was such a gigantic hit. It was something we were uh, enjoyed incorporating into the set. And I also look at it like it was kind of our power ballad. You know, the 80s had their power ballads, you know? Yeah. Those guys had to bring it down when they say play every rose and it's gone. So <laughs> I kind of was, I sold it a lot like that. It's our our, our our hair metal ballad that we put in the set. So there wasn't a lot of, ironically, friction mm-hmm. or, or kind of any maneuvering to navigate putting that song in the set because it blew up so quickly. And we knew people were looking forward to it. And 90% of the people there wanted to hear it, you know? Yeah. I mean, since it blew up so quickly, if you think about it, you kind of are the original meme king before there were memes. I mean, who names their album 1459 while putting out hit after hit after hit? I mean, that's just insane to me. Like, have you always been that self-deprecating? I think it's kind of ironic. I think a lot of people miss the fact that, like, I've been making fun of this band and me since day one. You know, I've never been precious about it. I mean, I think sometimes people don't know me or have a false sense of, you know, there's that sugar gay video that goes around that people just have a, a dip. And rightfully so. I acted like a react like a complete drunken moron that night. But I always stick up for my gay friends. Always, always. Mm-hmm. I just do it differently now. 
Um, <laughs> but but I've always made fun of myself. So I always find it weird when people think they're, and I hear people using my jokes on me. Like, oh, I bet they're playing a county fair. I'm like, yeah, motherfucker, I said that 20 years ago. My joke was, <laughs> my joke was, if you smell funnel cake, Sugar Ray's playing. I'm like, it's like people are missing it that no one makes fun of me or the band better than me. I've been doing it for years, just like you said. I, I would love to say it was the meme king. I, I'm not smart enough to, to, to thought that far ahead. You got to understand, we started, there was no internet. Mm-hmm. There was no, we, our band had already gone and come up down the mountain before social media was even a thing. So I, I'm playing catch up. We're still playing catch up to all that. And thank God social media isn't, you know, part of our success story. It's definitely part of our information story, but we don't need to keep soaking the fires of it to, uh, to have a career. Thank God. We've got yeah. four songs that mean a lot to people and we're grateful to play them, but it's, you know, it's been fun kind of second half of the career to get caught up in this weird meme stuff. And, you know, every now and then I'll see my name on Twitter and like, you're, you're trending. You're like, what? Why? What did I do now? <laughs> always for something wrong and misconstrued. And it's just, so uh, it's just, it's social media is something I like was a break dancer. So I have always put myself out there. I've been made fun of my whole life. I've been making fun of me my whole life. So I am built for the negativity that social media has out there. I'm built for it. So mm-hmm. I get a kick out of it, to tell yeah. you the truth. But, but the meme king, I think that's a, that might be a stretch. I mean, you don't but give I'll yourself enough credit. You don't give yourself enough credit. I mean, are you thankful in a way that social media wasn't around? I mean, after after um, 1459 was out, you went on tours with like Orgy, like MTV Campus Invasion Tour. I can't imagine what that entailed. And if social media existed what would be on the internet from that tour? Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think Orgy's more <laughs> grateful than we are that social media was around that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, look it. I mean, definitely. It was, it was different times, you know, for sure. I can't imagine touring today. And then I just, it, it, yeah, it, it's, there's no doubt about it that uh, it, it would have been different. But yeah, I, it's, a, it's a different now. I mean, bands still have fun. It's about to have fun, I, I, but it's a different animal. There's a different set of rules, and rightfully so. Mm-hmm. And uh, you better live by them, or you're going to die by them. It's that simple, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. But it would have definitely would have cut down. The, it would have saved my uh, half my liver for sure. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> How was like MTV though? Do you have any funny stories like with doing like Spring Break or Sewa Karaoke? Or I mean, you were in it for a while doing a lot of those shows. MTV is a huge part of our story. You know, yeah. this this band has always had a visual element. In fact, we got signed off a video. Our friend McGee, who is still my best friend, as I said this 30 times today, he decided to go, look, your songs suck. You guys aren't the best musicians. Your originals definitely suck. But there's a visual thing happening here. I can rob Peter to pay Paul to make a video on 35 millimeter film, which is like what they were doing on MTV back then. One that looks like it's ready to go on MTV. So he's, and he said, your only shot to get in. You're more of a visual band. There's not a song. We had a song called Lick Me and Caboose. And we chose the title. We chose the title that was least offensive to make a video to. It. It's that simple. And so making a video and getting signed by, we got signed off the video. Uh, Doug Morris was the uh, president of Atlantic Records at the time. And he said, I don't care what this band, this band is why I'm in music. They're having fun. And this is way when grunge was just like, Everybody was so angry and staring at your shoes. And, and if you looked like you were having fun, it wasn't, you know. But we just came out like, ah, this is so cool. We got dogs. We're, we're, we're skating on ice. Kind of what you see in Mean Machine is kind of what Caboose was. I was going to ask, the, is that the same ice skating rink that you do at both videos? We, we definitely use the same ice rink, indeed. Got a better deal on the second time. We had a record mm-hmm. deal off it. But then, you know, we had a little bit more money. So we got to film at the comedy store. And just, it was funny. The label goes, listen, we need a treatment for the video. We go, what's that? We go, we don't make treatments. We just shoot things we like and that are fun. Like a big bulldog's face. Uh, people playing ice hockey with their shirts off at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, people skateboarding, you know, just cool the stuff we thought was cool. Right. They kind of... That kind of defined the aesthetic that was to come. You know, the jackass era that was on its way, that was already in the air. We didn't discover it, but all of us were, was percolating amongst our DNA growing up in the beaches of Southern California, where it's, you know, snowboarding, skateboarding, surfing, it would all, music would all just come to one sort of Robert Johnson's crossroads, if you will. And we were all kind of feeling it out, whether you were Johnny Knoxville, whether you were Gwen Stefani, whether you were Offspring, we're all just kind of fit. We were just leading, it was leading us to one promised land, which became the sort of aesthetic that all of us were a part of. But MTV was the goal. 
When I first saw our video on MTV, man, to me it was it was better than hearing our our, our song on the radio for the first time. I know it's probably blasphemy to say, but that was that was the you know ha ah, moment, you know. And then when the video just got on rotation, and it was like you'd see it again, you're like, oh my god, it's on again. And your video was on Beavis and Butthead. Yeah, Beavis and Butthead. That was I mean, even that's that, that was sort of the first record. I yeah. mean, the first. Me and Machine got on uh, 120 minutes, and it got on Beavis and Butthead. So we we were fine. We're like, look, we got an MTV a little bit, and if that's all whatever it is, fine. But then we got into rotation. We got to experience the complete MTV experience. We got nominated for an MTV uh, Video Music Awards. I became a rock and jock DJ. I mean, I got to experience all that MTV has to offer. And I'll always always be grateful for that. And it's a bummer it's gone away because it was a real yeah. communal thing. You know, we all saw the new the new pr music premiere video come out. TRL was part of the thing. Like it was all part of our conventional way of receiving new music and deciding what you want to buy and what you don't want to buy. And I always be grateful to them for the, the career they gave me. You know, because there was a Friday in probably June of '97 where I could go anywhere in the world. By that Monday, I, I I couldn't go anywhere in America without being noticed. It was that quickly. It was crazy. And MTV okay. was the uh, vehicle. I mean, me and Wonder, like, we're obviously still stuck in the 90s with what we do with this French party. So we always just say, like, we were born in the wrong era. I mean, we grew up with it. We loved it. But I wish, I mean, me personally, I wish I was old enough to, like, experience it. But I grew up watching it all the time. I, I, you know, I think it's interesting. And, and I went through this, too. You know, and, and again, I'll say it again. You look back at decades differently. Once you're removed from them and you, it's like an ex-girlfriend or an ex-boyfriend. You only remember the good about it, you know, and you remember the good things. And, and, and you know, the 90s were, were great I, I, and it was fun and it made all my dreams come true. So you're talking to someone who really benefited from the 90s. But you know, the 90s were different, too. I mean, mm -hmm. there's great things going on now. Every decade has its own movement, its own youth movement. And you can sit there and be like an old curmudgeon and go, oh, I remember this and MTV. I remember these away videos and be that guy. Or you can just go, man, things has changed and evolved and it's different. I mean, I remember my mom and dad walked in. I was playing The Clash. And my dad goes, this is the worst music I've ever heard. It'll never go anywhere. It's atonal. It sucks. And it was so foreign to him. Ten years later, punk rock was the biggest thing in commercial uh, music. So it just, it's got to change. But what's great is when you can look back and like you guys do, celebrate that decade. You know, you, 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 you sort of bet through all the stuff that maybe made it make decade great. And, you know... You include things that are like, you know, we didn't make the 90s great. We were part of it. The 90s made us great. You know what I mean? The 90s gave okay. us experiences, you know? Okay. I mean, agree to disagree, but you guys made the 90s. No, you're very <laughs> sweet. You're very sweet. <laughs> and that's, what we're, that's what we're riding on now, those nostalgia and memories. You know, and a lot of bands don't like to embrace that. But if you look up the word nostalgia in the dictionary, find me one negative adjective in the description. I mean, people are like, Mark, you know, we, I have the, I do a lot of cameos. We're like, Mark, we, we have such great memories of listening to fly in the summer. And my dad's no longer with us. And like these magical moments that I know what they're talking about. Cause I had the same one with my mom and dad and family. And to like be part of that, I don't care what decade you're from. That that's that magical stuff as a songwriter, a band member, you know? It is. I mean, cause music is like the closest thing to time travel we have, you know what I mean? And like, we can be doing this forever. I mean, us as DJs, you as a musician, I'm sure you can relate to that, but you can't go see like Michael Jordan play a game tonight, you know, like he's done, but like you can go to a grunge party, you can go to a Sugar Ray party. And I think that's something like super special. It's really funny you say that because I use that sports analogy a lot of the times because I say this, so it's kind of being proven with Mike Tyson and Roy Jones fighting again. I always say Michael Jordan would be playing tonight in the NBA if he could. I mean, because some people ask me, are you still doing the band thing? You're still playing music? I go, I won the lottery. Are you kidding me? I'm going to play until I'm 75 and fall into a Grand Slam breakfast at Denny's. <laughs> playing in a bar cell one night at, at, when that fly is about to end. I just want to. And I will be so happy to go out that way. I'm going to play. We play music because we can still do it. Yeah, we're getting a little fatter. And yeah, we might be wearing the black t-shirts to hang over our leather pants. You know what I mean? But we are still there doing it because we love it. I mean, and it's also what I do. You don't ask a dentist who's like 53, hey, when are you going to stop this dentistry thing? You know, it's what I do. It's my job. I'm never, I'm so grateful to be in this position. So I'm not going to be one to give up the uniform. And I promise you, like you said, 
if Jordan could be playing, he'd be playing right now. It's a very astute analogy. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and speaking of you playing, when are we going to expect Sugar Ray in New York? Because we're in a serious drought right now. We're in a serious yeah, you know, we're, we're, drought. And so I, I, the irony of that is we're a band that got back to playing quickly because by the grace of God, and as I said, we've got a few songs that people want to hear that kind of that kind of uh, go across a lot of demographics, you know. So we've been playing a lot of like the Taste of Jacksonville, a lot of casinos and stuff like that. What we haven't done a lot of is toured in the last couple of years. So hopefully next year we got something brewing, some other 90s acts are coming hardcore 90s style. So I think you'll see us out there sometimes. But keep an eye out. We're always playing a casino or something near the, the city or somewhere around there. But we don't do a lot of touring with some of the other bands because, you know, fortunately we do a lot of the fly-ins that keep this band alive. Do you mind if I play that song and I'm going to remind you about brunch? Yeah, please. Please do. And 90s grunge brunch, man. That is so cool. In New York City, well, you can count me in when the corona is over. So when it's over... That's the time you can count me in And when COVID's over That's the time you can count me in For grunge, 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 grunge I know I'll be a grunge Be a grunge All things that I used to say All what's got in the way All things that I used to know Have gone out the window to bring all songs she used to sing all favorite tv shows have gone out the window gone out the window we've gone to the grunge brunch again Woo! we're holding out for you to do grunge here in new york i'm just putting uh, you on the spot just putting you on the spot but you can count me in i promise because you guys have been, it's been a lot of fun watching the memes you guys put out and and the way you guys celebrate the decade and and, you know, you, you, you have fun with it, but you also have a reverence for it, which uh, makes it fun for us. You know, all of us survivors of the 90s have been through it all. And so we're really, our, our radar is up of when you're coming at us and when you're not. And we can see when the heart and soul is in the right place of the music. All of us have made mistakes. All our bands did stupid things. All of us had stupid styles. But, you know, now that we've kind of come out the other side, we're still surviving. People that really hold a special place in the heart for that music, we can tell. And mm-hmm. Grunch is that very sort of organization. So I'm grateful that you guys uh, are around and it's an honor. So you can count on me hanging out with you guys next time for sure. Hell yeah. But there's a lot of really great things and great music that came out of that decade, you know. And if people like it or not, it's the last really definable decade. You know, you, you know when the 90s ended and you know when they began. I don't know what you call the yachts. I don't know what you call the teens. I don't, I guess we're in the twenties now. There hasn't been a de- definition of a, a decade, a defined decade since the nineties, because that's when the music industry ended and streaming started. And, and so it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I don't know what people are calling the odds. So they, I don't know what they're calling them. So Mm-mm. there's also been a, a, you know, no real stylistic change radically in music since the nineties. So it's interesting. It's almost the last gasp. I don't want to say golden decade, but certainly a decade that, you know, you can tell when it came in and you can tell when it came out. (laughs) What do you make of people now that are like taking on the trend? I mean, like Y2K in nineties is very like full throttle right now. Like frosted tips are back. You know? Yeah. Never went went away in my house. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) It's either gray or the tips. Is that necessity now? I think it's fun. I mean, everybody look, I grew up in the eighties. I was young and, and fun and, and had stars in my eyes. And so we look back at the 60s for our fashion and stuff like that. So it's, I think it's just, it's, it's, an, it's the natural evolution because everybody looks back and certainly with technology smacking everybody in the face, I can see why Y2K is kind of look back now like as something is, is a thing. And also I think the 90s was the last decade when technology wasn't really a factor too, right. which, is, which is interesting. So if you really want to get out of this decade or get out of what we're doing, you got to go back to the 90s. It was the last one that was untouched by technology. I mean, that's what was so great, though, in a way, because everything is so accessible now. Back then, if you heard a record or you wanted like a pair of shoes, like, I don't know, you had to go to like a store, record store, dig for it in vinyl. Now everything is just download Amazon.com. You know what I mean? Like, there's no real thrill, I feel, anymore that we use. I, I, I totally agree. And everybody's cool. And like, everybody has the same like top 10 iTunes list, like, you right. know. 
you know, I, 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 Mumford and Sons, and you know, but, but everybody forgot about Poison. Nobody listens to Poison. You know, it's like it's just, it's just, fun, it's just funny. Like everybody curates this one aesthetic that we have to have, and it also happens every airport around the world looks the same now. So I agree, I miss that. Now my first pair of Creepers, which were those Creepers with the crepe sole, yeah, and you know, like you know, the, the punk rockers wore them, Rockabilly's wore them. I sent away on the back of a UK magazine to England. I cut out this thing for a pair of creepers. And I sent a cashier's check and it said delivery comes in eight to 12 weeks. I mean, Smash Bros. wrote a song, six to eight weeks to arrive. Remember that? Uh, yes. walk in some. And it reminds me that because I just sent a check and then seven months later, my creepers came to my house. But how amazing you know? was that feeling? It wasn't like instant gratification. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I it, miss that. You had to work for it and like to get the color and they were a size, they were half size too small by the time they came. And I wore the hell out of those things. And now George Cox, I go overnight and have the creepers here by tomorrow, tomorrow. And I've done that before just because like, you know, just because I can. Yeah. I don't even know what's cool anymore. You're right. Because mm -hmm. everything's accessible. But I, yeah, it's, it's interesting. You really hit on some interesting points that really show the major differences between today and the 90s. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. You guys are really... You've lived it. It seems like you're living it. It's in your DNA. It is. Re real quick, Alana, uh, talking about sending away for stuff, why don't you show Mark your, your, uh, your, the clock that you have there? Oh, yeah. I have a special clock. Let me see. Ooh, you got one of the 1459 promotional 1459, clocks. Yes. I told you, dude, I'm the eBay queen. So how did you, you how did you, uh, oh, so you got an eBay. Does it work? Yes, it works. I need to get in. I need to get a new battery, but it does work. I promise you. No, that's crazy because those are, uh, you know, those are over twenty. That's twenty three years old right here. And yeah. I wonder why. I, I, I don't want to ask what you paid for, but how much you paid for that? <laughs> um, I think it was a bidder for like a solid fifty dollars. Wow, that's you so know? crazy. That's so great. Pri priceless, priceless, Mark. Priceless. Well, there weren't a lot made. I'll have you know that was that was made by the label, and they were given out to major pop stations only. So all the big pop stations, so like the Z one hundreds, the PLJs got them, uh, Kiss FM got them. So that was just the big. There's probably a hundred of those made. So wow, uh, you know, I mean, good company. You hold on for that for a while. That might be worth about fifty-five bucks in ten years. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, okay. I can't. I also have something else to show you. I don't know. Sure. If this guy looks familiar. Oh boy. Oh boy. Where is he? There he is. Wait a minute. You don't have our, my yearbook, do you? Oh, I do. Oh I my it. god. There you know, he is. Oh, there, there. Oh, look at the highlights back then. Check Dude, I'm out. saying you've been rocking the highlights like since high school. It's you know, I, I, to be honest with you guys, it's part, it's the McGrath family is from uh, County Cork, Ireland, and we've always had a blonde patch of our hair. It's gone pat down through generations. Yeah. So I don't even dye my hair. Dude, uh, yeah. And we also no, have no, no, don't believe in that. No, I wanted to be, I wanted to be John Taylor so bad. There's McGee. God, look at yeah. McGee. You know, it's funny. Say. McGee was like 5'2 his entire year through high school, and I was like six foot tall. And then the day he graduated from high school, he got his braces off and he grew like eight inches. I can't believe you have that. I don't, I don't even have a corner of high school yearbook. That's crazy. I got it all, man. We have a whole, what? we're going to start a Sugar Ray Museum. So when you come out. Let me out, tell you one more thing about that. Yeah. Leslie Mann is in that yearbook. No way. Okay. I got it. 19. That, what was that? Was that my sophomore year? What year was that? I can't find the year. I'm assuming it's your senior year, though, because you guys have all the colored photos in here. But if you go, okay, so if you go to 85. Yeah. No, go to 87. If there's an 87 in there, Leslie. Well, you're Mann, a senior here. You're a senior here. I'm a senior, okay. Yeah. Leslie Mann would have been a junior and, you know, probably 1987. And she's in there, Leslie Mann. Huh. Let me see. I mean, there's look, so many. Look her up. Look her up. Cause, cause, look around. You know, somehow, somehow she got like five years younger in her Wikipedia. <laughs> but and you, you were in a club called like the Corona Club? Yeah, we started a, our Black. football, sort of our, our football fan club was called Club Corona. But yeah, that's how, that's how, that was our creative uh, level was at back then. Because uh -huh. our school was called Corona Lamar High School. And Corona beer was kind of new then in the 80s. It was become imported from Mexico. And of course, you shouldn't be saying this, but we drank beer in high school. Uh, so we used the, hey, uh. we, used the we used the Corona, uh, the logo to that. It was Club Corona. And it was kind of a big deal because you know we, we used the beer logo and the school got all upset so you know we were raising hell back there in newport beach california i mean you guys were bad boys from the beginning 
you know? Yeah, you know, we, we had a good run in our bad boys, but at the end of the day, we're just not, you know, the bad boy, the bad boy DNA doesn't run that deep, but at the end of the day, I'm just a, uh, I'm an angel with a heart of gold. You know, a hooker with a heart of gold. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, one thing I did not touch on with the heart of gold and also a tram stamp tattoo, the candies oh ad, the candies right. ad. I, I have so many magazines, Mark. I mean, I'm telling you, I have the Sugar Ray Museum here. We have so right. many different magazines. Oh, my God. Let's talk about you, the candies ad for a minute, because it was wasn't it banned in the U.S. It was like too, too hot for TV. Well, what they did is they did a couple versions of it. They knew they would be banned. Yeah. So, so they would be talking about it. And that's what they kind of did. And they did it with Jenny McCarthy, Carmen Electra. And so, yeah, they made one that was going to be banned for sure. And then they made one that wasn't, you know, but you could see my tramp stamp and all its glory. <laughs> it is no longer there. I covered it up with a back tattoo. Oh, wow. Let's see if I show you guys. Okay. How amazing. Okay. Yeah. We can, we can see. I don't know what you're seeing back there. I apologize for <laughs> you. at home. But, uh, yeah, I had a, I had an but MC back there. You and did before I even heard the word tramp stamp, you know. Right. Uh, and I, th- I think I got that like in '91, and you know we were afraid to put tattoos in any place that was going to be seen because tattoos were scary. And, right. And you know you're 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 a, a jailbird if you had tattoos. So we you know we put them. I put it back there, and it's just beyond a tramp stamp. So I had to cover up my whole back to like make it make it go away. You know what I mean? No, so, you're the originator, man. You're setting the trends. Frosted tips, tramp stamps, uh, meme king, like. I've been following the trends for years and somehow I get, you know, I, I, I get the uh, residual. I mean, I remember my original thing in dyeing my hair, I'd seen, um, I saw a picture of Scott Weiland playing Madison Square Garden in Rolling Stone magazine. And he had, he looked like Bowie, he looked so cool. He had one little like white that skunk strip. strip. Yeah. That's right. A little yeah. skunk strip. And my drunk ass friend who was going to beauty school at the time, I go, dude, have you seen that picture? I want my hair just like that. We're shooting the fly video tomorrow. Can you come do it? He goes, yeah, I can do it. He hadn't even graduated yet. He comes up there. He's got his bathing suit on, all his crap. He's already drunk when he gets there. So I just got, fuck it. We started drinking beers. And he starts just putting spots on. I couldn't even see it. And my, oh, my yeah. hair was burning and blah, blah, blah. I woke up the next day and I had those spots all over my hair. And I showed up in the video for Fly and everybody was pissed off. The, the labels, they're like, what did you do to your hair? Because I used to have it greased back a little bit. It was kind of like a, a Reality mm-hmm. Bites, uh, Ethan Hawke type line. Yep. And, and they're like, well, you ruined the video. I mean, she was really pissed. You ruined the video, blah, blah, blah. Little I go, did I they know. know. Little did they know. Trendsetter. Well, it was yeah. orange. and really, So they had to bring another stylus in to make the orange whiter. So they had to bring someone in the last second. It was a big nightmare. I was hungover as hell. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, my friend is never doing my hair again. So we kind of oh, no. backwards fell into that hairdo. But got to, again, it's a Scott Weiland thing. By mistake, became that hairdo. I mean, it's all connected to the grunge, man. It is. It but is, RPM, man. Yeah, RPM, you have you have the highlights there, too. So was that shot after Fly? RPM, the video? Yeah, yeah. yeah. RPM was shot after Fly. I mean, I started toning the highlights down a little, or I started okay. getting better better haircuts with me. So I think in RPM video, my hair is almost blue. I started getting blue highlights-ish. Yeah. And answer the phone, it's definitely blue-ish in that. But I, was, I got kind of over it very quickly because I kind of got known for it. And then I started like dyeing my hair away. I just done all sorts of weird stuff, but yeah. I try to change it up every now and then. But it always seems to go back to the. It always highlights. comes back. Yeah. It always goes back to it. You know, at the end of the day, it's in my heart. What are you gonna do? I know what you're thinking. We got the same. Oh my too. god! Look at that. I got the skateboard too. Hold on. I got the lit skateboard on my wall. So you are not messing around. I love mm-hmm. those lit guys. You ever talk to the lit guys? Have not yet, but they're, they're a fan of the memes. They they like a lot of the content we put out there. So yeah, I haven't spoken to them yet. They're great guys. You should have them on this uh, the show of yours. They're just uh, so good. They laugh themselves and look. They 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 have the biggest song in the nineties. When when you want to show, uh, the worst thing to do is follow lit because when they start going, bah, 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 the whole. Fucking crazy. It looks like Rage Against Machine. You guys are right. both like the riff kings of the 90s. Like, oh, well, we had more of like the, you know, the islandy riffs, but they had that rock and they, they were a heavy metal band starting mm-hmm. out, as you know. So that was in their DNA. And I'm so glad to see them just hit because they're such good guys and such talented musicians. And all their songs are great. They're really just, they can't, it's impossible for them to write a bad song. You think you're going to tour with them again? Like the Under- I hope so. Yeah. 
Here's the good news. They're not, well, here's the good and bad news. They're not making any more new bands from the 90s. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, so, you know, the Jim Blossoms, the Smash Mouths of the world, uh, the Everclears, um, Vertical Horizons, you know, there's a bunch of us in that sort of mid-range level where we can't, where we're, we're more powerful together than, you know, but there's the, you know, the Google Dolls and the Collective Souls are kind of up here that can still do a lot of business by themselves. But when we all get together, it's fun. I love those guys. It's like summer camp. So I'm looking forward to hang with them again. I mean, that's what we look forward to every time we spin. That's all we play. So we're all that's great. Yeah, we're supposed to, stuff. we're supposed to, we're supposed to do like, it's, it started as a grunge only party. Then it kind of expanded. So now we basically just play any the stuff that we like from the nineties, a, a little bit away from the grunge stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, grunge was great, but like it's, it's limited. There's only so much you can do. There's one tone to grunge. You know what I mean? And it was a fun, fun scene. Probably the last scene ever. I mean, there was not really a music scene after Seattle. San Diego had a little bit of one with the like, you know, uh, Rocket from the Grip, Crip and Drive Like Jehu. But I think New York had a little scene with the Strokes and Interpol. But like, I mean, the last real scene where people had to go to Seattle and labels went up there. That, that was probably the last real you know, scene, thriving scene where bands went to that city, labels went up there, you know, the labels were already in New York. It, it was, it was important. It was important. It was also important to break down the wall. If we well, radically was for grunge, there'd be no Sugar Ray because right. gr grunge, you know, basically said, okay, if you have a Les Paul and a Marshall guitar, we're signing you. We're going to throw it against the wall and see what happens. We don't know where this is going. We know we hate guitar solos. We know we hate spandex now. You know what I mean? And if you fall anywhere within a punk realm, we're going to sign you. The major labels did that. And we got kind of, you know, we got kind of swept up in all that hysteria, if you will, from the labels. I mean, one thing I really admire about you, Mark, is like three times Jeopardy winner, right? So, I mean, your taste is very eclectic. I feel like you're just a Wikipedia of tons of music knowledge information and I mean, speaking of grunge, how we started off with grunge, we also then went into new metal. We went into like the reggae, the pop, like there's so many different genres of the 90s. Like it was this Lollapalooza explosion, like you said, which is what became grunge at the end of the day. But yeah. as far as being a three times Jeopardy winner, I mean, you also you challenge the dude at Howard Stern. You do a lot of people come and challenge you like to try and <laughs> beat you at your trivia. It's so annoying. I mean, it's just it's amazing the impact that had. I mean, yeah. people still to this day want to talk about that before they want to talk about like the mass singer or anything I've done recently. It's just always about rock and roll Jeopardy. And it really did a lot for the band. It gave us a little bit of gravitas because at that time, you know, I was like the sexy rocker people guy, kind of douche guy with the highlights. And then I go on and destroy on rock and roll Jeopardy. People are like, oh shit, this guy knows his music. I'm like a fan. This really is the sexiest guy and he knows all his music. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Years in the 90s. But you know what I mean? It's like that, that, that really let a lot of people go, okay, you know, oh man, we wanted to hate these guys. We wanted, you know, but they, I think they just saw me with such, and I think, but my performance on Rock and Roll Jeopardy, it kind of lends itself to what you hear in the music. Because I love Peter Tosh, you know, but I love Bad Brains and everything in between, mm -hmm. you know. I love Her Herman's Hermits and I, I love, uh, you know, I, I love T.S. Well. So, and it all gets played at once in, in my house. So, through all of that, it just kind of led into my songwriting. As I got better as a songwriter, uh, that's when the hits started coming. So, I, I think the three-time Rock and Roll Je the Rock and Roll Jeopardy thing and having the trivia knowledge really lent itself to like exploring music genres and not being precious about any genre. You know, I'm not being afraid to try a song with KRS-One or do a song with Wilson Phillips. You know, I just, I was open to everything because I love music. It's only 12 notes. It's how you rap them, you know? Right. And people got so shocked when they saw you in like a Cannibal Corpse shirt. They're like, Mark knows who this is. It's like, People just tend to put everyone in a box, I guess. You know what I mean? Yeah, they do. I understand that. And then, like, you know, you'll have Kendall Jenner now, though, in a Slayer shirt. So, I mean, I understand that, you know. Right. Name three so songs. <laughs> I, I, I've got a Cannibal Corpse shirt from 94, and my wife's been trying to throw it out forever. And I saw something. It was like a vintage shirt thing on uh, Instagram. And that shirt's worth, like, $800 now. And I'm like, I told you we should never throw it out. I still have it, thank God. But yeah, I, I love music. And like, I was a rockabilly growing up. I was a mod. I was a punk. I was into breakdancing. And I'd buy all the records associated with those genres, but I wouldn't throw them away once I was done with them. I loved them all. I loved them all equally. I have memories of all of that. So I think limiting yourself 
There would be no Sugar Ray if we decided to go, oh, we're only going to do this rock stuff. And ironically, you saw him fly that I absolutely hated in its initial incarnation, which wasn't even the song. It was a thing that led, led to me opening my mind about what this band could be. Absolutely. Would you ever envision yourself as a DJ with all of your music knowledge? Or? <sighs> well, what, do you, what kind of DJ? Um, I mean, I don't know. A grunge DJ. I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I can think you doing like an all vinyl set, like Clash, Sex Pistols, like I don't know, like any yeah, type I, of thing. I, I would, I could see myself doing that. I'd rather be, I'd be, I'd start playing it and go out and fun and start dancing around like a lunatic. You know, I just, I, I love music. I wouldn't want to have to be like responsible of queuing things up and like uh, the technology part. It drives me crazy. Listening like this and like I, you know, I can't do multiple things at once. I got to focus on. On what's happening so uh yeah i'll leave it to the i'll leave it to the uh legends and the uh experts like wondered okay fair enough all right speaking <laughs> of real quick real quick how is uh how's homicide doing now have you have you spoken to him lately i haven't spoken to him in a while you know it's interesting he quit the band it's funny in the early 2000s the dj culture was starting to take off and i go dude why you, go play these gigs? Go to Vegas, do this thing. Your best friend with DJ Am. They were best friends, Craig and DJ Am and Travis and all those guys. They were all best friends, homicide. And uh he goes, No, I'm not that kind of DJ, I'm more of a scratcher. And I go, oh, whatever. And then he slowly started like AM took him under his wings. And he goes, dude, you're missing out money. And slowly started making more money to the point where he was making more money than he was making with sugar egg. And then he left the band. He goes, I, I don't want to do it anymore. But, you know, Craig's he's in his own cat. He gets in his own lane. I haven't spoken to him in a while. I know I, I saw something on the Internet like last week where he goes, I'm retiring from DJing or something. So, yeah, I, think I, he, I don't I, I guess I, he's retired. I don't know if it's uh, it was a health. He had a health issue uh, maybe like six months ago. I'm thinking, yeah, something. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Maybe I don't know if that led to it or, or what the deal is. But, yeah, I hope sure it's a combination better. of things. You know, I'm sure it's combinations. I mean, I, I know he cut down on DJing and they had a health issue. I mean, he was taking care of his mom for a long time. So Craig's solid dude. I love the guy. He's very important to the, the sound and, the, and the, the backbeat of Sugar Ray. I mean, Rodney wrote a lot of his licks, our guitar player. He and, he and Craig would just mess around. Craig would play a loop, and Rodney would get a feel for it, you know? Rodney needed to hear something to write something, and Craig was a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, partner for him in that sense. So there would be no, like, fly every morning – Without without Craig, Craig is a huge part of uh, the oral sculpture, if you will, of this band. You trying to get in there as the next Sugar Ray DJ? Wonder is that that what you're I mean, trying to do? That's like a dream job, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can only hope. Don't say that to be a part of it, man. Just, hey. just, just you don't want to see how them sausages made, bro. <laughs> <laughs> wonder, wonder DJs like sway in the morning, um, so that's his whole shtick, like as serious. So whenever I would go DJ on his show. I would always geek out being around like Howard Stern and all that. So that's, that's like, awesome, man. Yeah. Well, give Sway my love, man. Sway, Sway, the, the homicide know each other for years. Wait, and, uh, every now and then they let me go on Sway's show because I knew Craig and Sway is always just, uh, a good cat. Is Heather B still on that show? She's still around? Yep, she's on there. Yeah, every morning. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> hey! Yeah. One day, say hello for me, would you? Oh. Hey. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. well, I've had a great time talking to you guys, man. And, you know, I'm happy to do this again. You know, okay. it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I you mean, we, we didn't even I touch mean, upon so many things, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm available. You guys hit me up on my Instagram or whatever. I'm happy to do it again, you know. I appreciate you doing it for the charity. That's, that's wonderful. You know, it's I really know. Cool. It feels good to, like, give back to something, too. So I was stoked that they were doing that. Yeah, no, no, I was honored to be asked. And then I, I didn't know it was even you. I had no idea who it was. And just to see you guys uh, – come up with the thing. I've had a great time talking. I can't be in part of an hour. My God. I know. Thanks for giving us all this time. <laughs> it was yeah, awesome. my my plan, I love to go down. I love to like sort of set the record straight works and all of how it happened, you know, and I just mm -hmm. let you know, look, there's three sides to every story as we know, but sometimes you don't get to hear mine all the time. And mine is always told for me, which is interesting. So it's, it's good to be able to sort of, you know, just get asked questions directly. So I appreciate it. For sure. I mean, we'll catch you soon. We'll try and set a grunch up with you. There you go. Yeah. I love it. I'm in. I'm grunch okay. all the way. And yeah, it was it was wonderful getting to talk to you. I mean, it's a dream come true. If you told like 10 year old me, I'd be talking to Mark on Zoom. I'd be like, what? I mean, AOL Instant Messenger only existed then. So this is a brand <laughs> technology, but I would have been so stoked. So this is oh, you're very wonderful. sweet.
Thank well, you. I can tell you, you know, having yearbooks and all that, you're just, uh, I can't thank you enough for the years of love and support for the band Sugar Ray. For sure. And I, I, I can't thank you guys for carrying the torch for that generation. You know what I mean? It was a lot of fun. You know, it was a really, it was a really, real. I feel grateful to have gone through it. And I'm honored that uh, folks like you are still carrying the torch. It's wonderful. It's not over yet. All the best, you guys. We'll talk <laughs> soon, right? Thank you. Yeah. Have a good night. Take care. Have a good Bye. one. Bye. Bye.